as I wait. You make me strong as I long. Draw me to your arms as I stand. And I sing your praise. You come, you can come and you fill this place. Won't you come, won't you come and you fill this place. I'm here to be with you. Come and meet with me. Good morning. Hey, did you have a good week this week? And I'm sure glad to be back out here with you. I miss you. Uh, a couple of things that I have got to do this morning. One is i got to make a few announcements, and one of them is that if you have not signed up for one of the spiritual formation classes that we have going on here throughout the week, I just want to invite you to do that. Uh, there's still time. It's not too late. Also, the, if you read your bulletin, it's got an announcement about the Holy Spirit Conference. that will be going on in Louisville, First United Methodist Church, starting Friday. And the timing is wrong. It's going to start at 1 and go to 9 instead of from 9 to 1. So anyway, just make a note of that. Also, if you've noticed all these blue shirts scattered throughout our sanctuary this morning, uh, Disciple Now weekend was this weekend. And uh, I think Deborah said that she had, has had a great time. Uh, have you had a good time? Yeah. Boy, that was weak. Have you had a good time? Yeah. Great. Well, Zach is going to come and share with us some things that went on this weekend. Hey, y'all. I'm Zach. Uh, I just want to tell y'all a little bit about what went on this, this weekend at Disciple Now. Okay, Friday, everybody got here, and we met in the fellowship hall, and we got in our groups, and we went to the house, our host houses, which uh, we pretty much lived there the whole weekend, and mess up their house, and they feed us, and so that's, I just want to thank all the host families. Uh, so we went there, and dropped off our stuff. Uh, and then we uh, came back and ate, and we went to the first session. And it was, uh, it was really moving. Uh, we had the Robbie Shea band there this weekend. And also our speaker, Jared, he was great. Uh, and then we uh, went back to the house. And I know our guys, 12th grade and 11th grade, we had a lot of fun. We played Risk. I don't know what the girls did. They probably had like a makeup party or something. Uh, and then so the next day we got up late or as late as possible to make it to the morning session. And uh, so we went to the morning session, and then all that afternoon we had free time. So our group played football, and we went to Pap's place and ate, and it was really good. And, uh, and then that night, last night, we had the final session, and we stayed up late again. So in conclusion, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. and. Uh, if you ever had the chance to do it, if you're younger or whatever, or you didn't do it this year, but you want to do it, I would definitely recommend you do it. So nothing spiritual went on this weekend. <clears throat> Makeup and games. Well, that's all right. But we do thank you for, uh, from us, from the staff, we thank you so very much for hosting these uh, guys and gals, I know it will. It's so meaningful to them. It was meaningful to me back when I was growing up. For when we had disciple now, so this has been going on for a while now, and uh, they the impact that the impact that it had on them, they won't, it probably won't be realized until several days down the road when they can get sit down and absorb it all and get some rest. I'm sure. I'm sure most of them are tired. Uh, one other thing that uh, I, I need to do this morning is that this church is so lay-led. I mean, we have such great laity, le leadership. I didn't do a thing. Sounds like, is this the monitor? <clears throat> in, 
any way. Uh, we, we have, uh, is it me? Okay. Where was I? Yeah, we are. We're lay led. We're so we're so lay led, and we're grateful for being lay led. Uh, and we have such good leadership here. What in the world is it? This microphone? Maybe we should we should stop and pray at this point. Uh, <laughs> dang. <clears throat> She's, she's saying something to you. <laughs> uh, but each year we have, at the beginning of in January, we have new officers that take over in various positions in this uh, church. And boy, I tell you, this thing is getting crazy this morning. Oh, you know God's going to do something great with all this going on, I promise you. Uh, but we, we, I, we have what we call a consecration service. When we just have a simple prayer for those who will be in leadership position in the coming year. And I know we have some folks here this morning that will be in some of those leadership positions. So I'll just ask you very briefly, if you are an officer in this church or a Sunday school teacher in this church, would you please stand? Okay, well what I want to do, while, while they're standing, I want you to keep standing. Uh, these, again, these are people who have said, yes, we will we'll serve in leadership positions in the church, and we're so grateful for them. And just know that, as you, as, uh, that we have many opportunities for others who want to serve in leadership positions in this church, and we're always open uh, for new leadership for sure. So if you feel like the Lord leading you in that direction, please feel free to come and talk to us, and we'll plug you in somewhere. But this time, let us join together in prayer. So we can uh, pray for these and pray that God would guide them as they guide us in the church this new year. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so very much for those who answer your call. Your call to ministry, your call to leadership. And dear God, we have some standing before us today who have willingly said, yes, Lord, I will serve. And dear God, we just ask that you just uh, anoint them from on high. I pray, dear God, that you would just guide them and guide their decision-making as we move into a new year. And I pray, dear God, that the decisions that they make and the decisions that the committees make, dear God, would only glorify you. And, and, and I pray, dear God, that they're seek, just seeking to move forward uh, in this wonderful, wonderful church in the new year. Dear God, again, we ask that you just give them knowledge, give them wisdom as they make these crucial decisions for a very, very important ministry. Dear God, thank you for them. Bless them. And dear God, bless our time together this morning as we've gathered to worship you. Pray, dear God, that you would just send your Holy Spirit down upon all of us today. And dear God, I pray that you meet us today at the point that we need to be met the most. In your most precious and holy name, amen. You guys want to stand up? All right. You are holy, you are holy, you are mighty, you are mighty, you are worthy, you are worthy, worthy of praise, worthy of praise, I will follow, I will follow, I will listen, I will listen, I will love you. I will love you all of my days. All of my days. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love Him, adore Him. I will bow down before Him to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love him, adore him. I will bow down before him. You're my 
Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. Come on, girl, sing it out. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will listen. I will love you. I will love you all of my days. All of my days. And I will sing to and worship you. are mighty God.
it up for the band. <clears throat> Blake, I'm going to borrow your stands. I hope that's all right. I won't mess it up, and I won't put any bad omens on or anything. Well, so we've been living in a backwards world this weekend, right? So what I hear, so why, why change things? Let's continue that. So what I'm going to do instead of preaching tonight's sermon tonight, I'm going to preach tonight's sermon this morning and preach this morning tonight. Would that be backwards enough? Okay, well, let's do that then. Let's do that. Uh, our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Luke 9, 57 through 62. And let me just kind of set the scene for you. Jesus is journeying. He's walking. 
And as he's walking along, three people come and ask him some questions. And what they're asking him about, they're asking him about discipleship. They're wanting to know. They're, they're, wanting, they're saying to Jesus, we want to be a disciple. We want to commit our life to following you. And so in this conversation, Jesus responds, and he tells us some things about discipleship that I think are absolutely important for us as we make our journey to discipleship as well. Verse 57 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, think about it. Here Jesus Christ, the, the greatest individual that has ever lived and will ever live. He, 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 of course, you know, he went to the cross. He was changed water into wine. He made the blind see and the lame walk. He was an amazing man. He had the power. He was, in essence, God. God living among us. And you think about that and how great he was. But then even as great as he was, if you remember, in the beginning of all the Gospels, especially in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus invites others to come along with him as he journeys. You remember him walking by the seashore and calling those who were in the fishing boats, come and follow me. And, 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 he, and he called one after another, come and follow me. Will you, will you give up your life? Will you lay aside your dreams and your hopes? Will you lay aside your job and follow me as we share the good news of God through the world? And of course, one after another, there were 12 of them who, who said yes to Christ and said, yes, I will follow you. Well, the truth is, church, Christ is still calling people to discipleship. Christ is still calling people today to come and journey with Him as He proclaims the good news that I have come, I have died, and I have, I have made a way for you to be made right with God. Christ is still calling us today. I guess the question for you and for I is, are we responding as those first disciples did? Are we responding as those first disciples did? Are we saying yes to Christ when He is calling for us, asking us to come and be a part of His ministry? I'm afraid too often we are spectators. We or sideline Christians. We're just sitting on the sideline. We, we like the benefits of Christianity, but yet we're not in the game. We're not taking that next step. See, too often, too often we give our heart to God. We say, here's my heart, and we end it at that. I think discipleship is one more step. Discipleship is saying to God, not only am I going to give you my heart, but I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to give you my life to do as you want me to do. That's what discipleship, discipleship is the next step after salvation. And that's where we all are. Hopefully today, we're, we've all made that initial step into Christ. We've all, all said, that here's our heart. Now, it's just a matter of us giving Him our life. But one thing that I always have admired about Jesus, even beyond His power, even uh, beyond what He did for us on the cross, I've always admired Him because he was all, He's always, always honest. He's honest. He, he tells us up front that there's something, there's something that's going to cost us. He, he, never, he, never, he, he never makes it a bed of roses. He says, this is it. This is what discipleship is going to take. This is what discipleship means. And this is what discipleship is going to cost. And that's what he's, in essence, telling these three guys as he's journeying. These three, these three well, the uh, scriptures, they didn't say it was guys, but the King James Version said it was guys. And, 
We assume it's guys just because back in those days that's all they really talked to was guys. So we, we assumed that it was three guys, but just really and truly it could be any three people. Any three people, men, women, boys, or girls. Three people came to Christ as he was walking down the road and asked him some questions. And Jesus responded, and his response tells us a whole lot about what it means to be and what it takes to be a disciple. Jesus responds in verses 57 and 58. He says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In essence, Jesus is telling this first individual who, come, who, can, who comes to him and says, I want to be a disciple. Jesus is, in essence, telling him to be a disciple means, it means sacrificing. It means sacrificing. Sacri See, Jesus was, in, he was saying, you will have to experience some of the very things I have experienced in my journey. That's what discipleship means. It means counting the cost. Now, in Luke 14, 25 through 33, you don't have to turn there, but let me read this for you, because I think it, again, Jesus clarifies the cost involved in discipleship. Luke 14, 25 through 33 says, Now large crowds were traveling with him, talking about Jesus, and, it, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross for, or, and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Now think about that. Jesus says, look, this is what it means to be a disciple. It means you have to love me more than anybody else in your life. You have to love me more than your father, love me more than your mother, you have, to want this to, you have to want to do this. The desire to do this has to be greater than any other desire that you can have or will face or will have in your future. Jesus says, and before you commit to this, sit down and count the cost and to see whether you have what it takes to complete the task. Now, I think that's an important thing for us to hear today because, see, Jesus doesn't want just part-time disciples. He wants those people who are willing to surrender their all forever, right now and the days following now. And folks, that's not an easy task. That is not an easy task, especially living in the world we live in. Because as you've learned this weekend, especially this group, that we're like fish swimming upstream. We're living in a backwards place. So therefore, it, it means it's going to cost something. There was a story I heard one time about <clears throat> a guy who needed transportation from one part of the United States to the other. Now, this was back in the days when we didn't have planes, trains, or automobiles, which, by the way, is one of my favorite shows. There was only horses and stagecoaches. Horses and stagecoach. That was the only mode of or, or, or walking. But this guy needed some transportation, and he didn't have a horse, and he needed to get from one end of the state to the other, so he, he decided to go to the stagecoach office and buy a ticket to ride on the stagecoach. Now, I know without a doubt, not a single person here probably has probably ever ridden on a stagecoach. Maybe you have, but I know you've seen them, right? And how many seats are in a stagecoach? What? There's two. There's one on each end of the stagecoach, right? Y'all have got to get out in the world. Let me just tell you that. Open a book. But yeah, there was, there's two seats. So this guy goes to the stagecoach office, and he walks up, and there's a $5 ticket, a $3 ticket, and a $1 ticket. And so he says to himself, he says, Self, it, it's just stupid to buy a $5 ticket to ride on the stagecoach. There's only two seats, and we're all in the same seats. He said, I'm going to buy a $1 ticket. Smart enough. So he buys a ticket, he gets on the stagecoach, they're going down these old bumpy dirt trails, and he's going along thinking to himself, man, I am the smartest man in this stagecoach because I have bought a $1 ticket and the rest of these dummies have bought $3 and $5 tickets. He's feeling pretty good about himself. Well, the stagecoach stops. 
And he looks out the window, and, and there's a huge hill that they're about to climb. The stagecoach driver gets off, and he says, those of you who've got a $5 ticket, keep your seat. Those of you that's got a $3 ticket, get out and stand beside the stagecoach. Those of you that got a $1 ticket, get out and push. See, he didn't consider the differences in the price. He didn't consider the cost. And if he had, I imagine, something tells me that he would have bought a $3 or a $5 ticket. So see, that's the way it is with discipleship. We have to consider the cost. Do we have what it takes to finish the task? Do we have what it takes? Then right about the time you're thinking, well, I don't know if it's worth it. Let me tell you something. It is absolutely worth it. It is the most rewarding thing that you can ever do in your life to be sold out fully for Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, a great theologian, said it like this. He said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. I'll read that to you again. A religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, suffers nothing, is worth nothing. Anything good in life, folks, it costs something. Anything worthwhile in life costs something. The question that we have to ask ourselves are, is, are, are, is are, are, we willing, are we willing to make the sacrifice? Are we willing to make the sacrifice? Well, the second thing that Jesus informs us about discipleship as, well, you know, we're thinking, well, one more thing you're thinking about that sacrifice. You know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I know you've not seen stagecoaches, but have you ever heard that story? Hmm. Okay. I, don't, I didn't really want to tell the whole story, but apparently this whole side has never heard it, so I, I may have to tell it again. But in essence, it's three, three, three young men. Who, who decided not to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's wishes. King Nebuchadnezzar started out to be a good man, but then by, by, by the time we get to the end of the story, he's, he's an awful man, he's, and, he's, and he's built himself these false gods, these images out of gold, and he's made a decree that says, and sends a decree out saying, it, when, when the music sounds, you have to bow down and worship these idols. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decided we're not going to do that because we love God. We love God. We believe in God. And, and we're, not going to, we're not going to sell out that easy. So Nebuchadnezzar hears that these three guys are, dis, uh, are disobeying this decree. And he goes to them and says, hey, I hear you three guys are not obeying me. I hear, I hear that y'all are not bowing down to these idols when the music plays like you're supposed to. And they said, that's right. And he said, well, maybe you misunderstood. Maybe you're just confused. We're going to play the music again, and then we're going to, I'm going to give you an opportunity to bow down to these idols. And, of course, the music plays, and they just stood still, stood firm, and, and didn't bow down. And Nebuchadnezzar said, now, you knew that if you didn't do that, I said I was going to throw you into the fire. And they said, that's right, but we'd rather be in the fire and know that we stood true to God than to sell ourselves out for a false idol, for a false idol. They were willing to sacrifice their lives for what they believed. They felt it was that important. And folks, it is that important. Discipleship is absolutely that important. Of course, we know the story. They were thrown into the fire, and as, as Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, there were four people in the fire instead of three, and it was God walking with them, just as he will with us if we choose to sacrifice and become a sold-out disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, let's move on. Verse 59 through 60, another, the second individual comes to Jesus, and this is how that conversation goes. He says, well, let me find it. Mm -hmm. There it is. He said to another, he said, follow me. But the guy says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you, but as far as you go, but, but as far as you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus says, Let's go. All right, you ready to follow me? Let's go. And he said, Well, no, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. First, let me go take care of my business. And Jesus, in essence, it sounds like Jesus is being mean here. When he says, when the guy says, let me go bury my father, and Jesus says, no, you let the dead bury the dead. 
Now, before you think that Jesus was mean, let's think about this scenario just a second. If this guy's father was sick enough that he was near death, I, I doubt very seriously he'd be out on the road walking with guys up and, and, and talking and doing his own thing, right? So it really doesn't make sense. And in essence, this was an excuse. This guy was eating it. The guy's dad might have been sick. We, we don't know that. But I, we do know one thing, that if his dad was dying, was near death, surely he would have been with his father. But Jesus knew that he was using this as an excuse. See, he, 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 does, he was doing what we often do. We often say, yeah, that, yeah, that's what we want to do. And we come to a disciple now weekend and we get so excited about it and we want to give our life and we want to be a disciple and we want to sell out and do all that. But then when Jesus says, okay, let's go, we say, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. First, let me do what I need to do. And Jesus is in essence telling us that discipleship doesn't only mean sacrifice, it means complete and total obedience complete and total obedience to the will of God in your life. Obedience. He, he wants us to obey. He wants us to strike while the iron's hot. In essence, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit moves, you move. And you do it right then. I can't tell you how many times in my own life where God, I just felt God saying, Jason, go and do this. And, I'll, and, I, and I've said, I have said, okay, I'm going to do that, but I've got to go to Walmart, pick up some groceries, I've got to get some gas, I've got to go get the kids, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and the first thing you know, the moment has passed. The moment has passed, and, it, and, and I never did what I felt God leading me to do. But the moment had passed, and I just pray that somebody else heard God's call and took care of whatever he needed me to take care of. That's not always my prayer. God, I hope somebody else said yes because I failed you at this moment. Obedience, complete and total obedience. You, let me ask you, if you may not know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you know about Jonah? Man, I'm getting to the basics here. Come on. See, Jonah, he, he didn't get the obedience thing right off the bat, did he? He ran. God said, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah ran. He ran. He said, God, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. No, no, no. Those people are bad. I'm not going there. He ran. But guess what happened in the end? God found him. You, see, hey, there's a good lesson in that for us all. You can't hide from God. And when God begins to call you out and call you to a deeper walk, because that's what discipleship is. It's a deeper more personal, more intimate walk with Christ. And God is calling us out to do that. And God says, I want you, and I'm not going to give up till I get you. And you may end up in the belly of a whale while you wait. But God will find you. And he's not going to quit on you until you say yes. I'll tell you another interesting story about Jonah. I heard a, a great theologian say one day, I've never, I, I've read the story in and it never dawned on him, but the whale spit Jonah out at the very place, that, at the very beginning, right where he first ran from God. Isn't that amazing? It, it God took him all the way back to the beginning and said, okay, we're going to start this whole thing over. See, Jonah wasn't obedient, but he was, he, he was obedient at the end, wasn't he? That, but see, he could have avoided all that if he would have just said yes at that moment God said, I want you. And church, God is saying to all of us, He wants us, He needs us, and He wants us to be obedient to His will for our life. Now see, when you start talking about sacrifice and obedience, boy, I tell you, those things are very contrary uh, to what the world teaches us, isn't it? It is, because the world teaches us that it's about us, it's about me, it's about I. It's about making me happy, doing what I want to do. And, and, and not about anybody else. But see, God says, no, that's not the way it is. It's not about you. It's not about I. It's about me, Jesus Christ. It's about God. It's about you doing what I want you to do, setting aside your will, your hopes, your dreams for mine, for mine. And folks, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It is one adventure after another following Christ. It's some of the most fun that you can possibly ever have. 
It's an exciting thing for me to wake up on Monday morning not having any idea what the week holds for me at this church or in my ministry. It is an amazing thing. Sometimes scary, but more often than not, exciting. Exciting. And I, that's why I love the new year, because we have no idea what this new year has in store for us. We have no idea the good that God's going to have us do. We have no idea the places he's going to put us in. But we do know one thing. We do know that he only wants the best for us. And when we're sold out and surrendered to him, wherever it is, we know it's going to be good. And he's going to equip us to handle whatever it is that comes our way. See, yes, there is a cost. There is a cost, and there is, he, he does require complete sacrifice and complete obedience. But yet it's, again, one of the most rewarding things, knowing at the end of the day, when you lay your head down, that you have sold yourself out totally to Christ, and you have done, just, you have spent that day serving and being a disciple. What a phenomenal task that we have before us. Well, finally, finally, the third person comes and verse 61 it said, Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to them, Him, no one who puts his hand to a plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus says it must be total sacrifice, there must be complete obedience, but there must be dedication as well. This, we must be dedicated to being a disciple. Complete dedication is, is, all that, is all that he's asking for us. You know, and then I think Jesus is saying to this last and final guy, he says, look, once you decide to do this, once you decide, yes, God, this is what I'm going to do. I've given you my heart, and I want to give you my life, and I want you to use it as you see fit. He's saying, once we decide that, he said, let's not look back. Let's live our life moving forward in search of that next disciple. You remember what, at the end of Matthew, what Jesus tells us? You know, he could have said anything he wanted to. He could have said, you know, he could have said, do one to others. He could have said... Uh, you know, be a good neighbor. He could have said uh, anything he wanted to in his last, in, in, at the end. But remember what he chose to say? He said, go ye therefore and make other disciples. Go ye therefore and make other disciples. He's, and, and I think in essence that's what Jesus is telling this third individual who comes and says, I want to follow you. He says, once you do that, put your hands in the plow and never look back. And if you think about it, the Apostle Paul in his writing, everything that Paul says, it's about looking forward, isn't it? It's about moving forward in search of that prize which lays before us. And the way I understand heaven is up. It's always out. Reaching, we, we're reaching out to God. We're reaching out to heaven. Never behind us. And, and the one thing, I think one reason Jesus talks about moving forward and this putting our hands to the plow and not looking back is because if we... If we spend too much time on the past, I think it, it bogs us down. It holds us back too often. Not only the bad, not only the sin that we left behind, but also the good. Sometimes I'm afraid as a church, we're living in the past. We're saying, remember when we used to do this? Remember how we did that? And remember last year? Remember last year when we, our disciple now last year? You remember uh, the, the fun we had? You know, if you're not careful, you'll live your life in the past. And that's as bad as living our life connected to our sin because it holds us back and it keeps us from reaching something and doing something new in the future. Jesus says discipleship means completely dedicating your life to Him. You know, at the close of life, I think the question will not be how much have you gotten, but how much have you given? The question won't be how much have you won, but the question will be how much have you done. The question won't be how much have you saved, but the question will be how much have you sacrificed. It will be how much you have loved and how much you have served, not how much you were honored. That's the questions that will present, be presented to us all at the end of our life. How much have you served? How much have you loved? How much have you sacrificed? How much, have you give, how much time have you given in service to God? Those are the things 
that will matter in the end. Let me ask you something, church. Do you have what it takes to be a disciple? Do you have what it takes? Jesus Christ is calling us. He's still calling people today to surrender their life not just your heart. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about beyond that, something deeper, which is discipleship. I know God's calling you today. He's calling you today. Another one of my favorite scriptures in Matthew, it says, look, the harvest is white. The harvest is white. The, uh, it, it, it's, it's plentiful. And Jesus prays the prayer. Or ask God, he said, God, would you send me people? Would you send me people who will help reap this harvest? Church, he's calling you. Will you count the cost? Will you consider surrendering completely and totally to God? Dear Lord, we thank you so very much for your son, Jesus Christ, and his complete and total surrendering to you. Dear God, we thank you for those who have gone before us, who have surrendered their life, those Sunday school teachers, those youth ministers. Dear God, those people who have touched us in a mighty, mighty way. Dear God, these are people who have given themselves totally to you. And dear God, thank you for those people. And dear God, I know right now as you're moving, as we prepare to sing our final song, dear God, we know that you are calling people to surrender completely and totally to you. And dear God, my prayer for them is that they would just quit holding back and allow you to completely grasp their life and use it as you see fit. Dear God, forgive us what we've held back and help us now, dear God, to give it all to you. In your name we pray, amen. As the band plays, the altar's open. Would you come and use it? To, maybe you want to come and... and, and and, and, and make that sacrifice. Say, God, I want to sell out completely to you. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, and you want to do that today. What a great way to begin this new year. As the band plays for just a few stanzas, we're just going to ask you to use the altar as the Lord leads you, and then we'll have our closing prayer. The altars are open. Cast out our idols, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not Lift our souls to another. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not Lift our souls to another. 
Oh, God, let us be a generation that saves, sings your face. Oh, God of Jacob, oh, God, let us be a generation that sings, sings your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to one another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to one another. Oh God, let us be. A generation that sings, sings your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that sings, sings your face, O oh God of Jacob. Sings your face. Oh, God of Jacob, we seek your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Oh, God of Jacob. I ask our ushers to come forward, please. All right, and you want to stand for our closing chorus? Uh. God is bigger than the air I breathe. The world will be. God will save the day. Oh, we'll say my glory Yeah. 
In the Old Testament, Samuel said, Here I am, Lord. God called out in the night. He said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. I hope that as you leave today, you're saying the same thing. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And go knowing that you don't go alone. You go with the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you. Leave the chairs in their place. Don't move them. You're dismissed.